Well, take a look here at Acts chapter, we're going to look at 1421 just to get a running start on it. Acts 1421 through chapter 5. Are y'all noticing that in the Dallas area, bow ties are getting uh, fashionable <laughs> from Dak Prescott? Yes. <laughs> Not me. I walked out of the house this morning. I said to Teresa, how do I look? She said, you look real diaper. <laughs> That's dapper. <laughs> 14, she really did. 1421. A little East Texas humor right there. Uh, in the, during the times of the 16th century, the Protestant Reformation, uh, there were wars between Protestants and Catholics in Germany. And so they came to a treaty, and the terms of the treaty were, he that has the region has the religion. Germany had like 200, and I believe it's 50 some odd, states or principalities that were all independent all ruled by princes, didn't get together until the uh, 1800s into a particular country. But uh, all of these princes would choose their religion, what they would be, Catholic, Protestant, Reformed, Lutheran, whatever, they would choose their religion. And uh, there was a particular council uh, that they were coming together in which a particular princip was going to determine its religion. And the prince of that principality, it is said, sent a, uh, his representative to the council to come back with the stamp on what that principality would be, which would be Protestant. And he said to his emissary, the emissary said, what would you like me to come back with? He said, you come back with one word, Sola. Not simply uh, fide, faith that saves, but sola fide. That it's not faith in Christ as well as your works that save. It's not faith in Christ as well as the sacraments of Catholicism that save. It is faith alone in Christ that saves. Now, remember that. Because that is the nature of Acts 15. Acts 15 is a watershed on all of church history. Because it is the first church council is Acts 15, the council at Jerusalem. It is called together because of the first heresy that salvation is faith plus law, faith plus circumcision. And if they don't come together and make a decision you will forevermore after that have uh, two Christianities, Jewish Christianity and Gentile Christianity. And so this is the first heresy, the first church council, and they're going to give the first church or the first apostles' creed. Acts 15, 11, we believe that by we are saved by the grace of the Lord Jesus, even as the rest. This is the first apostles' creed. Well, stay with me right here. Let's get a running start. In chapter 14, verse 21, Paul has finished his preaching in the first missionary journey. And now he's going to retrace his steps. He's going to go right back where he was. Because whenever you come to faith in Christ and evangelism, you've only now begun the Christian life. Your Christian life is not over. Now you have to visit with the apostles and the Word of God as to what your discipleship looks like. Amen. You don't just begin the Christian life after you get off your knees at the altar at the front. You have just begun it. Now you begin to long for the pure milk of the Word. And so Paul now retraces his steps. And in verse 22, he will strengthen the souls of the disciples. He's going to go to verse 21. To He returns to Lystra. Then he returns to Iconium. And then he returns to Antioch, Pisidia. And he strengthens their souls. What this discipleship or establishing would have been 
is that you would have introduced new ideas to these ancient Celts. And that's what they are, the Galatians. They're ancient Celts. Uh, justification by faith. What? What's justification? All right, let me tell you. It's by faith. Okay, I understand. Just because you trust Christ as Savior doesn't mean that you fully understood what you did. It takes you time to have it sink into you. Uh, we are saved by the imputation. The what? The imputation of the righteousness of Christ. After our sin was imputed to him on the cross. I beg your pardon? Yeah. And he could bear our sin because he was the incarnation of God in man. What? Yeah. He was the God man. He wasn't just a good man. He was the God man. And how did that happen? Because God is, they may not have invented the word Trinity, but they could have. God is Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The Son became a man. And describe for me now the Son. And so Paul would have gone back to these guys that weeks before were polytheists. And he is now introducing them to the height of Jewish theology, of Christianity. How would you have liked that job? That's what his job is, is to break new ground. I would have loved to have been at them Q&A sessions that Paul has with these Galatians. And Paul would have introduced new ethics. One man, one wife. The heck you say? That's a fact. One man, one wife. And you do not beat her. You treat her as Christ did the church. How's that? And sex outside of marriage. No. Fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. This is meant, really? Where do you get that? Genesis. What's a Genesis? Okay. Let's start at the Garden of Eden. Eden? Is that down by Perga? No, no. So Paul has to introduce a new world, new vocabulary, new theology, new everything to these guys. That's why he wrote the epistles. They were follow-up letters founding these novices in new belief. So you got new ideas, you got new ethics, and you have a new ideology called the church that Galatians, we're not saved by ourselves. We're in tandem. There's a bunch of us. We're the body of Christ, the flock of God, the priests of God, the stones of the temple, that we go through this world uh, together. And that we are now, in verse 22, through many tribulations we enter the kingdom of God. That this is not our final stay. There, this is not heaven on earth. We're going there, and the path of glory is the path of trial. So whenever the bad times hit and the persecutions hit, Galatians, that's the norm. Amen? Don't cut and run. Don't think God doesn't love you. We exult in our tribulations. If you suffer for the name of Christ, you're blessed because the spirit of glory in God is seen now to rest on you. So that's the mark of the saint, and Christ is coming back someday. And when you die, you're going to go be with him, and you're going to stand. So he introduces them to a new concept and to a fact of a new identity, that we're strangers and aliens. This world is not our own anymore. We're the children of God among the children of darkness. We're ambassadors. And he introduced them to verse 23, elders. Very important verse in verse 23. That I want, even though I'm leaving, I want all of you guys together and I want guys in charge. Elders were over the Jewish synagogue. The Jewish synagogue was an anticipation of the church. The synagogue was invented by Ezra when Israel was in exile for Jews who could not have come to the temple anymore because it was burned to be able to organize and worship. Synagogue, that they could come together and worship. And that idea prefaced the church. The church just stepped right into the synagogue as the meeting place of the true people of God. Anybody know from the book of Revelation what Christ calls the non-believing synagogue? It is the most politically incorrect statement in the New Testament. He calls it the synagogue of Satan. Anybody want to go preach that in Jerusalem today? But that's how he saw it that they're people that are outside the covenant of grace. And so, Paul establishes theology, ethics, the church, uh, the normativeness of suffering, 
and that these guys are elders. We're not going to have one guy run the church. Absolute power will corrupt absolutely. Always through history, great men become bad men when they have too much authority. And so elders are going to be in plurality, not to rule the church. You don't have a church with elder rule. You have Christ rule. You have elders that seek the will of God. That's the ideal. An abundance of counselors, there's victory. So these are all massive ideas that are now beginning in the New Testament age. We're used to them here. Churches, elders, pastors, and all that stuff. This is altogether new ground that Paul is establishing. And if you'll notice in verse 24, he passes through Pisidia and came down to the coast to Pamphylia. They had spoken the word in Perga, that's right on the coast. In other words, they had spoken in Perga what they gave there in verse 21 and 22, establishing disciples. And then he goes to Italia. Italia is the coastal harbor. So we're going to leave and not go to Cyprus. We're going to go straight home to Syria and to Antioch, Syria, his home church. And so in verse 26, he sails to Antioch from whence he had been commended to the grace of God. Uh, this, if you look in verse 23, it says they commended the church to the Lord. That word paratithene means to set down alongside of. Paul feels that even though he leaves the church, that someone is still there with every local church. Question, who's the someone that even though the apostles leave, Who's the someone that is still there that you can take the church and place it alongside of, and he will take care of them? Sounds like Jesus starts with a J. Yeah. That's why in the book of Revelation, the churches are said to be in the hand, the right hand of Christ. That ours is not just a historic belief in a person who came and died. We have established now a relationship to that person. Amen? Not just as individuals, but as a local assembly. There's nothing above the local church. There's no bishops, no archbishops, no cardinals, and no pope. It is the, the elders and then the apostles and their writings. Every church is independent of all supra-ecclesiastic power except that of the apostles. Now, there have been wars over that idea, over ecclesiology. And that is why at Denton Bible, we don't answer to anyone other than the Word of God through the New Testament. I don't have to worry about what some bishop in Fort Worth thinks we should be doing. Or for sure, nobody from Dallas. All right, so can I get a big amen on that? Thank you. Now, in verse 26, not only is the church commended to Christ for him to rule it through the elders, but also in verse 26, the, they, meaning Barnabas and Paul, they had been commended to the grace of God. Uh, that when they set off in this mission work, the church felt that we're giving you into the hands of God. Whenever we ordain a young man or a young woman to go into women's ministry, a guy to go into ministry, we commend them to the grace of God. And we always say to them, you're leaving your nest, Denton Bible. You're not leaving Christ. And His grace is going to be with you. You know what this teaches? Are you ready? that God will enable what God commands. Amen? That if I become a Bible study leader, a 2-7 leader, a missionary, that if God commands it and calls me to do it, God will give me the grace. If He says to me, where are we to find food that these may eat? I've got five loaves and a couple of fish. Bring it to me. That He will give enough so that I will gather up the broken pieces. 
God will take care of me. And so they had been paratithomy. They had been placed alongside. Paul headed off on that ship. They all waved bye-bye. And they said, God, you better be there with this guy. Is this true for sending a kid to college? Yeah, you place them in the hands of God. Well, they had been commended to the grace of God. Incidentally, did the grace of God, was it operative in Paul? Yes, he was. By the time he left that missionary field, there were disciples, there were leaders, and there, were, there was a beachhead. There were churches with elders. What did Paul go through? Beatings, threats, and stoning. Is it possible for the grace of God to coexist with sufferings and stonings? It better, because that is our experience. But God takes you through the valley of the shadow. Massive idea. And it, they had been commended to the grace of God for the work they had accomplished. Did God do it or did they do it? Both of them. It is a cooperative work. So that whenever Paul got together in verse 27, to report all the things God had done with them. This is the first verse on missionary ecclesiology. Look what God did. So Paul got home and he said, look what we did by God's grace. Look what God did through us. God is as glorified in your preaching as he is in men being converted. The angels look down and they say, did you see those people come to faith? And other angels would have said, did you see who was preaching? It was the same guy that back years ago, oh, I remember, I remember. That guy is now a vehicle of divine grace. Isn't that something? The Bible says of Gideon, and the Spirit of God clothed himself with Gideon. I will put you on like a glove, and I will use you. If you were God, would you use you? Look around. Would you use these people? I wouldn't. I would say you're saved. Sit in the back and don't tell anyone you're Christians. <laughs> That's what I would have done. That's better marketing. But he says, I'm going to use you as a representation of God on this planet to voice the Word of God with the same tongue that X years ago was telling those jokes and saying those phrases on I-35 going south. Or you don't look at me like you don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I'm going to use that same tongue to voice the words of the grace of God. Well, in verse 27, are y'all with me so far? I'm just having a good old time up here. All right. In verse 27, when they had arrived back in Antioch, Antioch of Syria, and gathered the church together, they began to report. This is also your first missionary conference. After you go to mission work, you come home and all the church gathers together to hear what God has done. Is a local church supposed to have elders? Yes. Are they supposed to be taught? Yes. Are they supposed to be excited about missions work? Yes. The idea of a local church that is not involved in missions is unfounded in the New Testament. And I can tell you from experience, if you get a church that loses its sense of the missio dei, of the mission of God, go and make disciples of all nations. If you get a church that loses that, they're going to become ingrown, and then they're going to become self-centered, and then they're going to only do things that placate them. They will lose sense of the need of grace, and they will die as a church if that happens. And so, just as here in a couple of weeks, we're going to get together in January for a missions conference, and we'll all come together and see all of the scores and scores of our guys that are out there, and we will all uh, rejoice in what God has done. And so, 
they reported all that God had done with them. And I want you to notice how he had opened a door of faith. That is a term that is first introduced here in this verse. It runs throughout all the way to the book of Revelation, opening a door of faith. What does that mean? It means that salvation is not something that you can talk a sinner into. If you try to convince a lost man to be saved without God opening to him a door to walk through, without him seeing a need of escape, without him seeing the flood that is coming so that he can get onto the ark, unless God does that, you will see nobody come to faith. I've told you before about a buddy of mine named Erwin Litzer uh, up in Moody Church in uh, Chicago. And he does a class in Bible preaching, hermeneutics, I'm sorry, homiletics. And he takes his students on a bus to a cemetery and he makes them preach a message to the headstones. And he makes them give an altar call. I'm going to ask you to get up and come forward. And he makes them give an altar call. And then he says, how did you do? Well, we're not going to save a spot on the bus because nobody came up. And he says to them, you have as much chance getting a dead man out of that grave as you do getting a rebel embrace Christ. That's not going to happen unless God preemptively goes into their heart and, quote unquote, opens the heart of Lydia to respond. Nobody is going to come. And so it is a sovereign act of God. Christ is called the door. I am the door. He that goes in by me shall go in and out and find pasture. Christ is the door into heaven. But men can't see it. Y'all, y'all remember the Twilight Zone? Anybody here remember Twilight Zone with Rod Serling? You would see ever so often uh, alternative universe Twilight Zones. You'd also see them on Outer Limits, all right, Outer Limits, Twilight Zone, uh, to, to where you would see an all, someone would slip into an alternative universe, or he would slip into a time warp, into a different time. And it was always entertaining that there was this possibility. Now I think they call it a oh, slider, a wormhole, or, or a, a smartphone or something like that. <laughs> all right, but you slide into a new universe. Well, believe it or not, that is what salvation is. It's heaven encountering moles who are blind and can't see it. It's heaven singing a song that humans can't hear. And God has to open actively a door that they see. There's a way out. It's not my intelligence, not my strength, not my being gluten-free. All right. That's not going to get me saved. God gave his word, gave his son, gave the cross, and they see it. You can't see. It's like looking at a 3D picture where you can't see it until all of a sudden it pops on you. Well, that's what salvation is. God has to open the door. In other words, the idea of a monergistic salvation, it's one work. It's the activity of God predestining, calling, converting, keeping, and raising That's what salvation is. So Calvin didn't invent that. God invented that. So God has to open the door. He has to open your ears. Ifatha, be opened and you can hear. He has to put clay on your eyes like Adam of rebirth and tell you to wash in the pool of Siloam of the sent one. And all of a sudden you see. That's what salvation is. And so Paul says, look what God did by God opening a door. Amen. That's why you're saved. We don't represent the smartest guys in Denton County. Look around. We are a society of vessels of mercy that God has poured out his unmerited and deserved grace and power to bring us home. Shepherds go get sheep. Sheep don't seek for shepherds. He went and got us. So, 
Incidentally, you want a great picture of this? There was an author back in the 1940s, wrote during World War II. He was a Brit, his name was C.S. Lewis. And he wrote about four children during the war. And uh, to get out of it, they went up into a man's attic. And there they found something. It was a wardrobe. And they opened a door. And they entered into a new universe, time and place. With the good guy, the lion called Aslan, and then a witch. And it was always winter and never Christmas. And there was redemption and there was a battle, and they would escape the world they were in and go into a new world. And it was called the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe. Now, that was the idea of an opening into a new world. Clive Staples Lewis gave you a little Calvinism, and you didn't know you were reading it at the time. Okay. Well, in verse 28, what do you do after... You go home from missions, you spend a long time with the disciples. They had a place called Starbucks that was there in Syria. And so Paul would just go hang out and go, whew, that was a journey. That has been my model of ministry all my life, is you wait for God to open up a door, then you go and you bear up and you preach and you see, and then when the smoke clears, you see disciples, elders, churches, then you go to Starbucks and you sit down and you eat and drink, and then you shore up uh, Antioch. The churches will be no stronger than Antioch. You make sure the home base is strong. Then you venture out. Then you venture out. So you do young guns, young guns, BTCP, 2-7, BTCL, small groups, and then you venture out into the community, and then you come back. And you strengthen, you, you, what they say in Isaiah? You strengthen your stakes so that you can lengthen your cords. Okay, you come back home. So you get up, you spend time with the Lord, and you wait for God to say, here we go again. And you head off. The Christian ministry and the Christian life moves in lurches. It doesn't move progressively. It lurches in different places. You just have to be faithful and push until God opens a door. Paul would pray in Colossians, pray that God may open a door for us, that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ. God, open a door. Well, uh, in chapter 15, now that's just the hors d'oeuvre. Let me show you the main course right here. Well, in the light of all this joy, here comes the Bronx cheer. Y'all know what the Bronx cheer is? That is the Bronx cheer. That'll show up well on tape, all right? <laughs> that's, the, that's a raspberry. It's the Bronx cheer. In light of all this stuff that is happening, all of a sudden, here come some guys from Judea. Here come some Jewish guys from across the, uh, the, uh, the mountain range, and they show up from Jerusalem on this fledgling church of Syrians. Former enemies of God. Y'all ever read in your Old Testament about the Arameans? A-R-A-M-E-A-N-S? The Arameans? That's Assyrian. That's where Antioch is located. And so these are former enemies that are all together while the Jewish churches over here in Israel are doing their deal. Here is a bunch of Gentile brothers. And here comes a bunch of guys from Judea. Now, Peter is going to say uh, in verse 24 of chapter 15, they were guys to whom we gave no instruction. They were not at the behest of the apostles in Jerusalem. They took it upon themselves to go to another church and to preach their own heterodoxical nuance. Whenever a young guy shows up in Denton, and says to me, I'm going to start a church. I always ask the question, and who are you to be an entrepreneur in the things of God? Who sends you? Who says you're worthy of being listened to, young man? What seminary, what church has sent you? Well, here were some guys that took it upon themselves 
to go straighten out their Gentile brothers. And if they had checked with Peter and the boys, they'd have said, don't you even dream about saying that. But they went around them. Can that still happen in a church? Where you get self-possessed people that go around church leadership to go exalt themselves? Well, here come these guys from Judea. And they began teaching their Jewish, I'm sorry, their Gentile brethren. And here's what they taught them. Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you can't be saved. Whoa. In other words, all you guys that are happy about what God's done, you need to quit your happiness because you're not saved. I'd have swore I was saved. No, you're not. Because you got to do something. It's not sola fide. It's faith in Christ as well. And you got to go get circumcised. And you got to now become a Jew. The heck you say. Yep, that's a fact. Now, this is your first heresy. Faith plus is a heresy. It will prompt the book of Galatians. If any man preaches to you a gospel contrary to the one we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As I've said again, so I say again now, if any man, if even an angel is adding any work to salvation, let him be anathema, placed away from, anathema, let him be accursed. He is not in this church. Faith plus anything equals nothing. When you add to the grace of God, you've heard me give my illustration of my good buddy that was whooping up a great big old vat of gumbo and was pouring in Coors beer and was also spitting out his Copenhagen and got mixed up. Season, spit. Season, spit. And he dropped just a little bit of spit-flavored Copenhagen into the gumbo. Dinner served. Anybody want to eat? The whole thing's contaminated. That's what happens when you add one work to grace. The grace of God is a still pond over which the reflection of God can be seen. What happens when you drop one grain of sand in that pond, you have distorted the face. Salvation in Christ plus baptism. Really? Salvation in Christ, faith, plus the Lord's Supper, plus good works, plus church membership, plus you got to attend our church over here on whatever street we're on. That is called a heresy. And this will merit the first church council that that will end right here. They're real severe and real serious about this. Well, in verse 2, what happens? It says, when Paul and Barnabas had great dissension, the Greek says, no little dissension. Dissent means that we are at odds. Paul says, I'm not going to say, hey, we're both seeing it the same. We're not just going to be peacekeepers. He said, gentlemen, you are at arm's length with us. You crossed the line on this. And they had great debate. Paul pulled out his Bible and he said, you guys have added to the scripture. You can deny scripture by denying it or you can add to it. He said, you guys just added to the Bible. And we're not walking away from this. And we're not going to rubber stamp you all as being okay. And I for sure am not going to let you teach my boys here at Syria, at Antioch. And in verse 2, we're going to go to Jerusalem to the guys with the keys of the kingdom. The guys that Jesus said, the church is built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ the corner. They're the final word, are the witnesses. They're the, the lieutenants and the colonels who enforce the commands of the general. You remember John 14? I have many things to teach you and you can't endure them right now. But the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth will come, and He will guide you guys into how much of the truth? All the truth. So nobody can add to the writings 
of Matthew through John. It's done. And so let's go up and check out these guys. God has rigged church history so that none of us get to voice an opinion. We have to check with what the big boys said. So let's go check. Jesus told them already, he said, I'm going to give you the keys. You're the authority. And whatever you bind shall have been bound in heaven. And if you loose it and say it's okay, it will have been loosed in heaven. You guys are the voice of God on the earth. Not this guy and not this guy, but you guys are going to be the guys. And so, in verse 3, they being sent on their way by the church. You notice this idea of faith plus works doesn't bring great joy to the church. They said, we need a ruling on this. As a matter of fact, if you'll look at verse uh, 24, look ahead to verse 24. Peter wrote, since we have heard that some of our number to whom we gave no instruction have, what's the word? You got disturbed. The word, root word of disturbed is turbulence. When anybody thinks that they're not saved unless they do something, that their security is really an illusion, you really can't sing about heaven because you haven't done this. That's not a joyful idea. Would you all agree with that? That's not a happy idea. When somebody reads in the Bible what they think is a verse that says they can lose their salvation, they don't go, hot dang, I can still go to hell. This is great. If you'll look in your hymnal of songs of joy, See if you find a, a song. Look in the back in the index for legalism. See if you can find a hymn about heaven is conditional upon our particular works of religion. Hell, hell, we're going to hell. Hallelujah, we're going to hell. Unless you do this, isn't it grand? You ever sung that? Nobody sings that hymn. It's a despairing idea. And so the church said, we've got to settle this. I could have sworn I was secure and saved in my salvation. You're telling me I'm not? I've got to do this physical act? It's distressing. It's divisive. Spit in the gumbo. Write that down. It is spit in the gumbo. In verse 3, as they head along, they see Exhibit A. They're being sent on their way by the church, and they're passing through Phoenicia, that's on the coast, then into the middle of Israel, into Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles, and bringing great joy to all the brethren. What are they talking about? What God did through Christ. Christ and law? No, through Christ. And everybody's rejoicing at what Christ did. You can't point to legalism and say, look what happened. Look what good Christ did through legalism. Now, in verse 4, they arrive at Jerusalem. They're received by the church and the apostles and the elders and reported all God had done with them. So there's exhibit A. We have proof positive in these people. As a matter of fact, the book of Galatians says that here in, in chapter 2 of Galatians, they brought a guy and they pointed to him as exhibit A. His name was Titus. He was a Greek. And they said, this guy, he, there's nothing Jewish about him. But Titus, say something. And he said, glory to God in the highest for his son, Jesus Christ, my atoning lamb that gave me life and rebirth. I was this, but now I see not even Titus, though he was a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. So look what God did by grace. You know, when I was at North Texas, I've told you the story. We had a, my best friend named John Bowles played tackle for us and got saved. And he was a beast, John Bowles. He had an equal beast that came with him from Virginia Beach. And he was a linebacker. His name was Steve. He was 5'10", weighed about 270, 240. And he was a beast. And uh, I remember Steve came into my room one day, shut the door, because he was best friends with John. And he said, what happened to Bowles? 
John Bowles. And I thought, I'm going to die. I'm going to die right here. But he really wanted What happened to him? You were responsible in some way. You got to talking with him. And he is not who he was. And I said in so many words, Steve, I said, uh, is he a worse guy than he was? Oh, no. He said, I'm embarrassed around him. He said, he's not what he was. And I said, he became a Christian. And this guy, toughest guy to this day I've ever met was this guy. And uh, he looked at me. Matter of fact, I talked to him on the phone a few weeks ago. He had gone through some back problems when I called him. As soon as he heard my voice, he said, and I can't tell you what he said. All right. (laughs) But he said, all right. But I said he became a Christian, and he shut the door, and he said, because he was raised Greek Orthodox, and he said, what is a Christian? Like a little kid. I told him. Something changed his buddy, and I need to know what it was. And I told him. Well, here in in verse 3 and 4, Paul says, look what God did through Christ. And in verse 5, here comes rain on the parade. Some of the sect of the Pharisees who had believed. Is believe meaning that they were weak Christians? Or is it used in the same way of Simon the magician that it's a false belief? I think the latter. Paul in Galatians calls them false brethren who had sneaked in to spy out our liberty to bring us into bondage. That these were some Jewish guys that in Gentile nationalism wanted all these Gentiles now to become Jews. That's what they wanted. You all, it's great that you're this spreading faith that Christianity is good, but it needs to come under the canopy of Judaism. Well, in verse 5, watch this. It is necessary to circumcise them and to direct them to observe the law of Moses. Now look up at verse 1. Unless you are circumcised, according to Moses, you can't be saved. Verse 5, did you see a change? They don't say unless you are circumcised. They added something, didn't they? Unless you are circumcised and keep the law of Moses. Aha! That 38 went in this big, and it came out this big. See, circumcision just begins the Jewish process. Now you got diet code, and you got clothing code, and you have got hygienic code, and you've got festival days, and you've got fast days, and you've got sacrifices, and you've got tithing. You've got, guess how many commandments you got in the Old Testament? 613. That's what you got. Paul would write to the Galatians, and he says, uh, let it be known that any man who receives circumcision, he's under obligation to keep the whole law. You can have law or you can have grace, but you can't have them both. You can't have Ishmael and Isaac in the same camp. A child born of God's might and a child born of human might. One of them's got to go. So if you're here this morning and you're going to go to heaven because you've been a good guy and a great guy and you worked hard, we're glad to have you, but you don't belong here. See, we are a people who celebrate an institute of ex- or an institute of, of, of death, of execution, where sinners got crucified, that he rose from the dead to give us what we don't have. You're proud of what you do have. So we welcome you to the church, but you're not one of us. You're closer to being Muslim. You're closer to being Buddhist. But you're not Christian. You dig? You need to go to a, uh, a mosque. Not here. They're a people of law. We're a people of grace. And so, you can't have them both. And you need, you can't add Jesus to your mix and believe in Christ. You need to forget Jesus and just live according to your own righteousness. You can never sin. You can never say, I'm sorry. You can never apologize. You're perfect. And you have nothing to worry about as long as you don't die. 
So Peter now in verse 6 stands up and he says, gentlemen, in verse 7, after much debate, he stood up and said, you know that in the early days, God made a choice among you that by my mouth, the Gentiles would hear the words of the gospel. He says, God sent me to Cornelius, the beginning of the Gentiles. I didn't volunteer to go. God made me go. And in verse 8, God, who knows the heart, testified to them, giving them the Holy Spirit, as He did to us. He said, gentlemen, I saw God's Holy Spirit fall. It converted these guys, and they all spoke in tongues. They all spoke in other languages about the greatness of God, just like we did in chapter 2 at Jerusalem. So he said, God sent me, and God did this. Number 3 in verse 9, He made no distinction between us and them. You guys, the Pharisees, may want to make a distinction between us and them. But God did not. He saved us all on the basis of faith. And so now in verse 10, why do you put God to the test? You know what that means to put God to the test? You shall not tempt the Lord your God. You don't keep sinning to see how far you can push God. He says, you're making God mad in what you're doing. God chose me, God sent me, and God converted them. And you're saying that what God did isn't good enough. He said, boys, maybe you can come to God saying that, but I'm not. So maybe you can add circumcision to the mix. But he said, you better ask God, because God's not going to do this. And in verse 10, you put on the neck of the disciples a yoke which neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear. He says, boys, we're under Roman domination We formerly were under Greek domination, then we were under Persian domination, then we were under Babylonian domination because we got kicked out of the land, because we have violated the law. So he says, you're asking them to obey what we can't obey. No. Verse 11, let me give you the Apostles' Creed. We, all of us, believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus. Amen? There is your Apostles' Creed. How about baptism? You get baptized because you are saved. You're saved by grace. How about the Lord's Supper? You take the Lord's Supper because you are saved. You are saved by grace. How about good works? You do good works because you are saved. They are, mean, they are the ends. They're not the means. Big difference. We are saved by grace, amazing grace that opens the door, draws us to that knowledge, fills us with His Spirit, and converts us. And we don't add one work. That's why it didn't Bible. When you become a member, all you got to believe in is the inerrancy of Scripture, the Trinity, deity of Christ, His substitutionary death, and salvation by faith. If you hold to other beliefs, those are core beliefs. Other beliefs, that's okay. Come on in with us, and we're going to fix you. <laughs> all right? That's fine. So, but you come on in. Because you're, we don't expect you to be a theological wonder when you're saved. But you've got to believe in inerrancy, the Trinity, the atonement of Christ, justification by faith. However, everybody has to read, I'm sorry, has to give their testimony. Our elders check your testimony. You've got to show us that you believe correctly in the atonement of Christ and that you have been converted. And they read it. And every so often, we'll see works get in there. That, and we don't get a good reading over that person. A Christian should be able to articulate in glory in grace. Shouldn't be a discussion. And we get one that's hazy. And it gets spit out right out of the elder board. And they send it to the skunk boy right here. And then I got to talk to you. Convince me you know what the gospel is. Because if you add one work, if you say, I do believe that baptism is essential and inseparable from salvation, I do believe the Lord's Supper is instrumental in salvation, we don't let you in. I don't care if you have memorized Calvin's Institutes, we do not let you in. Because you are a horse of a different color. We're people of grace. And you're a person of works. You are Ishmael. We are Isaac. And so there is your first Apostles' Creed. We believe we're saved by the grace of the Lord Jesus, even as the rest. Come back with one word, sola.
be day. Are you with me? We need a song. Monty Mason, where are you and the Greenwood singers? You're going to have to have somebody sing this for you to follow this one. Pray with me. Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the grace of God. Oh God, you, you by your Holy Ghost convinced us of the lost fort that we could not defend of our own righteousness, that we were overrun. We were a catastrophe. We had sinned and there was no act of contrition. There was no act of works that we could do to take away our stain. Thank you for Christmas, for God becoming a man. Thank you for his perfect life. Thank you for Easter, his death and resurrection. And thank you for the new birth. And if there is one fellow, one lady in here this morning, a little boy, little girl, old man, old woman, who actually has thought they will come before a holy God in their hands being proud of what they have done. We empty our hands and we take merely the cross of Christ. Forbid it that I should boast, said Paul, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.